if you want to after the meeting see this again because it was so fascinating uh, you can go to the library's website and, and pull it out or share it with anybody um, i usually take it afterwards and we'll post it also on our um, historic society all right, yeah, and I'm going to introduce Dave Ketchman. We're talking tonight about the um, rifle range that Senator had. And um, again, I, I'll be back in the back. I have a list. If you need to get the flyers, you want to be on our list, just let me know. I'll make sure I get things mailed out to you uh, in an appropriate fashion. Yes, Did you do shirts and parking? I'm sorry? Did you do shirts and parking? Uh, no. What's that? Um, is that a place or? It was. It was? No, it was oh, no, I was like, yeah. Wow. I also work in the historian's office volunteering to put stuff away. Yeah, yeah. Let, me, let me tell you, friends, this town has saved some wonderful information. Your history is solid. <laughs> Just in part of them, East Ridge Road. Between, between, between yeah, and, and, it was and it was a German, it was a German club or park, yeah. and it, had, it was surrounded by a huge fence. And, um, and I remember when I was a kid, so that's something that would be very interesting. Yes, well, who's collecting that information? Do a you can come do a presentation for us. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let me uh, turn it over to Dave here. Okay. We'll get this thing started. Thanks, folks. Welcome, everybody. I'm Dave Cookman. I'm a Titanic historian and genealogist. And my interest in this lost history of rifle range came about 60 some years ago as a preteen. I lived, I grew up in a west around a quite on Catalpa Road and used to play with buddies and that on Saturdays. We'd go around the corner on the Belcota Drive, the end of Belcota. We'd drop down an embankment and there was a pond down there. We'd have there be uh, frogs and turtles and things like that that we'd go after and whatever. And as kids, we played down there quite often and what I remember, uh, there was an old foundation down there. Had no idea what it was, but there's a water pipe coming out of it. And the water was running. And I always wondered, you know, why didn't they shut the water off? And the other thing, uh, the old road that ran from through Seneca Park, which is still there today, um, in that area, it was embedded with clamshells, broken clamshells. Always wondered, you know, where the clamshells came from. <clears throat> and it, uh, my grandfather, Frank Mahler, had told me um, that there was an old hotel down there at one time. That's all I remember him telling me. And he, um, the, the other thing that uh, farther north was Rattlesnake Point. I always wondered where Rattlesnake Point got its name from. Where rifle range got its name from? Never knew. So these questions kind of buried in the back of my head. Back about last May of 2022, I was together with a bunch of my buddies and uh, for lunch, and this all came up, and I kind of decided I'm going on a crazy quest and looking for answers. I know, you know, answers to my 60 year old questions. I knew there was a racetrack down there. Uh, I was told it was a go-kart track. I never saw any go-karts there, but there was a racetrack there. Never knew why or who or anything like that. So uh, I went on a quest for answers. I started here at the library. Came over here one afternoon and just started going through local history. And I found oh, a couple little articles in that uh, and some old history, history, rather quite history books in that Maud West and didn't really tell me too much and went on and I found a couple of articles from around the press and it didn't tell me too much either. And um, there was a librarian here at the time that was helped me do a little research named Nora Pellish. She helped me look and she had found that there was a, a draft of a story about rifle range and that it had been it was downtown being cataloged and you know that might be what i'm looking for well 
It was like a month, month and a half, several <laughs> phone calls downtown and that and finally got them going and it came back here to the library. And I came over here one afternoon and they got it for me and I started flipping through it and it's like, oh my gosh, there's all my answers. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just, it led to such a phenomenal story after that, well above what I thought, what I was looking for. And that's why I'm here tonight to kind of share that information for people that don't know. And um, let's see. this is kind of like a quick, what, what it was about. Uh, it was the best rifle range in New York State, frequent visits with Buffalo Bill Cody. Buffalo, two of Buffalo Bill Cody's children are buried down in Mount Hope Cemetery. It hit 1900, it had the longest bar in any place in Monroe County. Steamboats and trains stopped there, brought people from the city of Rochester uh, down the river and brought them for lunch or picnicking. Uh, a train came through, stopped. Uh, they had a small zoo prior to Seneca Park Zoo there. They had a black bear, two bald eagles, and other wild game that all caged. And the people used to come, like we do to the Seneca Park Zoo, to visit. Um, it was noted for great food, the beer, and it, the entertainment that went on there. Uh, one of the big entertainment features were was uh, the clam bakes. They had what they called pit clam bakes, and they had baseball diamonds. Uh, you, uh, city of Rochester on Sundays, you couldn't play baseball in the city of Rochester. So guys would go elsewhere looking to Somerville or White City, different areas to get away and play baseball. And this was one of the places. And then they had a dance hall for dances on the weekends and things. It, it was a true destination. And it all came to an end pretty much in uh, 1962 when the uh, around the quite volunteer fire department came in and did a controlled burn and it went up in smoke. This was a draft, the first page of a draft that I found. It was by Gregory J. Meyer. And it just, I read that and it went on and on and on. And it just told me this whole story and it, it answered the questions I was looking for. Yet it told me so much more. And I went looking for Greg to talk with him. And I searched and looked in the Rhonda Quite and Rochester and I talked to a couple of Greg Myers and no, that's not the right person. And I did further research and I did find him. Turns out that Gregory J. Meyer passed away in 19, or 2013 down in Washington. He was a patent attorney. Okay, his, his, going back here a minute, his wife, I got in touch with his wife and his son, and they shared more information about this story, and also a book, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And this was, I don't know if they can get any bigger or not, but um, General Henry Brinker, another guy that I had never heard of, but he's in Rochester history somewhere. He did quite a bit for Rochester. He, um, uh, let's see, he was, he was born March 17th, 1831 in Hanover, Prussia. He was the owner of one of the first Rochester professional baseball teams, several breweries, and part owner of several local railroads. Brinker had determined Rochester needed a first-rate rifle range. He and 14 National Guard colleagues incorporated a club they called the Rifle Association of the 7th Division. 
they uh, they purchased 53 acres from Silas and Sarah Colt for $7,940 on November 1875. That area is where the rifle range, the original rifle range started. This is the incorporation papers. Uh, this is the original of this document is, was handwritten and is preserved in the law archives of the state of New York, located in Albany. This, this lady here is is Louise, uh, Louise Str Str Straudenmeyer. She was one of the ones that was involved in the actual building and ownership of Rifle Range. Now, there were two original hotels. One, the first one was built by, was built for Henry Brinker. It was built by Louise and, or Mary, I'm sorry, Mary, and her husband, her husband John, and they built this clubhouse hotel for Henry Brinker and ran it uh, through about 1881. And there was kind of a falling out between them. And Mary decided uh, about that time that she was going to go and buy her own property. She bought an L-shaped piece of property that next to Henry Brinker's. This is all part of Chapel Hill today. And they used to, the, the area was known at that time as Winona Woods. Uh, before Seneca Park was laid out, the only, only access to rifle range was, was a dirt lane between the Grant and Colt Farms through an apple orchard, down through a gully. That road, that access road today is pretty much Belcoated Drive. Um, there used to be a large sign at Somerville Boulevard entrance. Somerville Boulevard is now St. Paul Boulevard, which read New York State National Guards. Mary, Mary was 38 years old and a widow she had nine children and she remarried John Straudenmeyer uh, less than a year after her first husband, uh, George Sirth, had passed away. Uh, she married on September 5th, 1871. Six years into the marriage, they had their only child, Louise, born on November 5th, 1877. She was a child number 10 for Mary. This is John Straudenmeyer. Uh, this picture I believe is taken at the time, time of his wedding to Mary on September 5th, 1871. He was 33 years old. He was five years younger than Mary. He died at the age of 48 on December 7th, 1886. Both, both of Mary's husbands are buried next to each other in Mount Hope Cemetery. <laughs> this area, yeah, okay. The outline of this orange area is the Straudenmeyer property that Mary purchased. Um, you can see here is the longhouse. The buildings that she had were called the longhouse and a square house. And this <laughs> building here is the longhouse. And that was like kind of next to the tracks, it looked like an old railroad station. But it was a saloon and restaurant and everything at the summertime. Um, the other building here is the square house. And that was the hotel that she ran. The original hotel that Henry Brinker built and along with the Strondmeyers is right here. And that lasted till about 1886, it burned. And nobody really 
there isn't too much on documented about it except that it burned uh, the found there's pictures of the foundation and things like that that are, that were there and the Stradmeyers used it for dumping clamshells and things like that into and it was over overlooked the river this long building here is a horse shed that belonged to Henry Brinker it was 225 feet long and it housed between 40 and 60 horses also included there, they had built an ice house. And the ice house, um, ice was harvested from the pond in the wintertime and stored in the, in the ice house. The ice house was all insulated. It was insulated with sawdust and it was used mainly during the summertime or all year, but the summertime, keep beer cold and their food. Yeah, and as you see in the other locations here, there was a dance platform, outhouses, there was a two-story barn, there was a pistol range, an outside bar, and that was all there at one time, all gone. The way that the steamboats used to come from the city of Rochester or up, come up from Shalott, they used to stop here at the pier and then there was a staircase going straight up the embankment up about 85 feet and people climbed that and you know spent the afternoon went to lunch whatever had a few beers and left that way they did that for many years up until about 18 1894 then they moved i i th i'm guessing that uh you know the staircase was kind of a hindrance for people and also the maintenance on it and everything that uh, farther north several hundred yards you could actually walk from the river up to rifle range and that's that was the way the, the boats came at that point this is a picture of the square house it was um Oh, let's see. Yeah, this is about 1882. And this is one of the one of the first built. It was uh, to the rear corner here where the arrows. You can see somewhat of a building. This was General Brinker's horse shed that was on the other side of the railroad tracks. That was looking towards the river. To the left over here is the ice house. Okay, so when this was built, one of the things that it had, which was pretty neat for the 1880s, it had indoor plumbing. It had a men's room and a ladies' room. And the water, which was one of my questions, you know, where was the water coming from? There was um, a spring up in the hill opposite, uh, opposite the square house. And it was a, a hog's head, they called it. It was a large cask or a large barrel, and it was buried in white clay. And that was a spring that supplied water. It supplied water down to the pond, because the pond was hand built. And there was a fountain at one time in the middle of the pond. Another pipe supplied water to the square house. Um, okay. The um, construction of the, the construction of the pond and the ice house provided refrigeration all year round for food. Phone lines came in place about 1900. Electricity. They brought down a line around 1923, and it was from from um, oh, it was from Michael Megan's house. Michael Megan had bought three lots on Chestnut Hill Drive, the end of Chestnut Hill Drive, which is his house is at 88 Chestnut Hill, 
and he, property was around where Carriage Lane is today. And he had a path that that uh, went down embankment down to ro hotel and I mean, rifle range. He had a son-in-law that was an electrician that ran cable down there and just provided one or two lights in each room. And I mean, it had to be minimal because that back then and electric and long lines and everything as to how much power it really was, but they did provide at that point in time. The railroad came through. Henry Brinker was instrumental in bringing the railroad. He wanted to bring people from the city of Rochester, bring the military, everybody to his hotel, to his racetrack. And he was instrumental in uh, in bringing the railroad along the river from Rochester to Somerville and Windsor Beach. And it was first part of it was was finished in 1884. It was the Windsor, Windsor Beach Railroad. 1886, it became the Rome, Watertown, and Ogdensburg Railroad. Stops at Brinker's Rifle Range Hotel and his racetrack. This is a picture of the longhouse. Kind of looks like a railroad station, I think. But um, you see the Straudenmeyer's name on the roof. And this is Mary Straudenmeyer standing there and Michael Magan, her son in law. And this uh, it's about 1900. It's on the railroad side. You can see the, the main tracks. And over here on the far left hand corner, there was a siding that they allowed cars and stuff off the main main track and they were parked there. Now, I don't remember any of that siding that was long gone when I came along. Um, it's telephone pole, obviously there, it was around 1900. This is a view of the, the long house, the end of the long house, the square, square house is right here. And you can see around 1910, it shows that Rifle Range was a destination for bikers. Obviously no high wheelers. This is a map of uh, West Aranaquite about 1905. Um, Henry Brinker sold his property in 19, 1901, sold it to Fred Rochot for a whopping sum of $10. And uh, you can see where Fred's property was. This was the original Henry Brinker property. And the rifle, other rifle range, the Stroudmeyer property was right here in the orange. All this was Sarah Colt. And this road at the bottom here, this is pretty much Belcota Drive. And Chestnut Hill would have been coming in here and Winona Boulevard working its way down. This is the, the interior of the longhouse. Louise and Mike Magan are standing there behind the bar. It's, a, it's considered one of the, the, the longest bar Monroe County in 1900, and you can see kind of quite elegant for the time. I mean, woodwork and everything in it uh, was quite nice. This is J. D. Captain J. D. Scott in his steamboat. He was one of the steamboats that would bring people to rifle range, either from the city rifle range to Shalott, and he also went from Shalott to Seabreeze. And he ran, ran the J.D. Scott, one of the, one of the many steamboats that uh, stopped there. This is a picture of the J.D. Scott, and it's at the lower point where I had mentioned earlier where the people were able to get off and walk up the rifle range without going up a steep embankment. It was a short walk. Well, last, last December, I got access into Seneca Park on a gator, 
and the guy that was up the park, uh, John Gonzalez, that was showing me around, he said, I see some, the only thing I know that's strange is there's some old pilings down by the river. And he told me about it before we got there. And all of a sudden, you know, we get there and he pointed to me and I quick pulled this picture out and it was right where this picture was taken. It was the only run that I found of this whole thing, the whole rifle range that's still there today. From, and this picture was from 1894. This is another uh, steamer that the uh, city of, you know, steamer city of Rochester that came through and stopped. One of the things that was, they were famous for at the rifle range, which Mary Stroudenmeyer started in the late 1890s, she started these pit clam banks, which became popular through all through the rest of the 50 some years of uh, rifle range. And here it's showing a small group in the background. This is Mike Megan in his early years. He was a cabinet maker, probably building cameras and at the Gudlock Optical Company, and he also worked at Eastern Kodak. This is Mary Straudenmeyer, and that around the time when she married Michael in 1899. On the left here, this area right here, is the old foundation from the original Brinker Hotel. And you can see how close it is, because you can see the river here in the background, it was right towards the edge of the river. This is Louise Straudenmeyer and Michael Megan on their wedding day. This is Mary's daughter. And uh, they were married on October 31st. Halloween, 1899. One of, uh, one of the new entertainments that Michael Magan added in 1904, uh, new entertainment to Rifle Range Hotel, was in the form of cockfighting. He was raided on Sunday, May 1st, and four Gamecocks were confiscated. The men involved appeared before the grand jury and they were fined $50. So that, did, that didn't last long. Yeah. This here picture is the uh, Genesee, Genesee Gun Club, organized by Michael Megan, who is right here shooting. And uh, they're shooting clay pigeons about 1905. This group here was, they were, is from St. Michael's Church around 1910. They were there for a picnic. This is Michael Sir. It's Mary's Mary's uh, son, and he's washing clam bakes, clam bake vegetables around 1910. He's getting ready for the pit clam bake. This is a rear view of a square house again. It shows, well, you don't know it, but they're chestnut trees. And it's where Chestnut Hill Drive got their name because it was they had chestnut trees along that way. And I remember as a kid, uh, there was a house down in the end of Chestnut Hill by St. Paul Boulevard. And I remember the chestnuts all over the yard. It was one of the only places I probably have ever seen them. This is a picture of the Longhouse, about 1910. All these buildings were there and I never knew what they were. I never, never knew they were there. In um, 1913, there was a gentleman that came into the Longhouse Saloon during, during the summer, and it was in May, and he had a beer 
with William Sirth. And he left, walked out, and walked into the woods. He was found later that day by Frank Grant hanging, hanging by a wire in that, from a tree. He had hung himself. This is a picture of the clam bake, the clam bake pit tended by Michael, by Michael Bagan. He's right here standing. The way they did the pit clam bakes back then, they dug a trench or a hole about 10 feet in diameter. They lined it with granite rocks. They had rocks that weren't going to explode from the heat. Then they'd start a wood fire in it. And they'd put coke on top of it to get it hot and get the rocks hot. And when that was done and everything was ready, they pushed the coals out of the way and they put all these bag clams in place and corn and food, whatever they were using. And they would cover it over with corn stalks for moisture and then put burlap on top and then bury it for two, three hours. And that would cook it. And I mean, they said the smell was just wonderful that came from these, this pit. And they did this for over 50 years. And they started doing it in September and it ran to the end of October. And there were upwards at one time of 1,000 people at one of these events. Majority of them were around 200, but there was one that was just 1,000 people. Then they had, now if I don't pronounce this right, Metzl Soup. Um, it was um, butchering. It was a proper translation would be slaughter soup or butcher soup, a sausage and vegetable soup. It was a special festive dinner held after the slaughter and butchering of farm animals, normally a pig. And they had these, and I mean, two dollars. And these went on for many years. Uh, one of the things at Rifle Range, they had their own gardens. They they grew corn and vegetables. They had their um, livestock. They were all pretty much self-efficient, right down to making their own beer. Here is here's a picture in 1916, and. It shows the ice house right here. This little building right in here is the railroad, railroad um, shed. And then the square house. And then you can see this is the, the siding for the railroad. We see boxcars and stuff lined up on it. Uh, winter time, winter time, but business slowed up pretty much. People couldn't get there. And but the, come summertime, they would, uh, they prospered. They did very well. <clears throat> this next picture is four of, of Louise and Michael Megan's four daughters. Uh, Louise, Lorraine, Alma, and Alberta. <laughs> This, this is Fred List in front of the dance platform with his sons about 1946. You see the dance platform here in the background. Well, prior to that, there was another tragedy in 1926. There was a gentleman and his fiance, they were both widows, 43 years old. They had gone down there on a rifle range to visit on a Sunday afternoon. And he had his brand new day old 1926 Nash sedan. And he was there and getting ready to leave. And the two of them were in the car. And something happened real quick. And he was in reverse. And they plummeted off the gorge, dropped down 85 feet into 15 feet of water. Both of them died. That they were able to get her body out that night, 
They went back the next morning and recovered his body. His hands were gripped right to the wheel. They said they had to pry him off. Um, what they think happened was that prior to this time, uh, they, um, I think it was his, the guys um, was driving Model Ts, Ford Model Ts. Anybody that knows anything about Ford Model Ts is that there's three pedals on the floor. Two of them are for shifting and one's brake. And the one that's brake is right where your gas pedal would have been. And they think that he, new to the Nash, confused himself and hit the accelerator instead of the brake to slow up when he was backing up and off he went. So. <clears throat> this is a picture of Greg Meyer on the left. Greg is the author of this book and his buddy Dick Anderson in front of the square house about 1950. This is the beer license of Michael Magan and for Rifle Range. And as you can see, the address of Rifle Range is Rifle Range around the quite New York. That was the mailing address. <laughs> the other address here is his home on 88 Chestnut Hill Drive. That's Mike Megan behind the Square House Bar about 1948 at the age of 74 years old. He was known as King of the Clam Banks. He must have been quite the character, a colorful guy from stories and everything that I've been hearing in the newspaper and the cockfights and everything that went on there, but uh, he must have been quite the guy. This is Louise Rose Straudenmeyer Megan, Michael's wife, uh, nearly nearly 60 years old in August of 1936. Her early plans for her life was to be a musician, a concert <laughs> pianist. Well, it never happened. She ended up taking care of a restaurant. This is a picture around 1956, getting towards the end of rifle range. Um, it's a picture in a square house. Don't know who the people are. The, the person in the back here attending bar was Francis Duke Frank. Um, I did make out various beers in the picture at that time. Topper beer, which is local Genesee, Standard, and Budweiser. This shows various properties that Michael Megan purchased. This is the original rifle range down here. And he purchased various pieces of property to block other people coming in and opening up another hotel or business in his area. It was kind of his way of doing things and uh, it worked. And he bought all, most of uh, Brattlesnake Point, which is up here. This is Alma <laughs> Megan. She's um, at age 14 on the rear west side of the balcony of the square house. She's dressed as Charlie Chapman on March, on May 20th, 1918. Uh, prohibition hit. And that kind of, as we all know, the story kind of shut down the booze and beer and alcohol for everybody back then. Well, Rifle Range survived. It was kind of like an area that was out of sight, out of mind. The police went there. The fire department went there. <laughs> they all went drinking there. And it wasn't until almost the end of Prohibition that Michael kind of got a slap in the hand and he was fined $100. <laughs> but he survived all through that point in time. And This 
This again is the Megan girls, Alberta, Alma, and Louise, a happy moment around 1921. This is Louise Megan at the Rifle Range Pond in 1921. You can see a boat there, in front of a boat. The, the slide in the back is the ice house slide. It worked in the opposite direction that we all know sliding. They used it in the wintertime when they harvested the blocks of ice from the pond, they pushed the ice up into the ice house. This is pretty much the end, 1962. It shows uh, the Rondequai Volunteer Fire Department, their squad car, which was a night, which is really kind of neat. It was a 1948 Cadillac pickup that they had at that point in time. There is firemen, they're standing there. And that was the day they had uh, control burn and it all pretty much went up in smoke. This is Chief John C. Oldenbach, AKA Chubby, on a second floor window of the square house while he can while he's watching the control burn in 1962. <clears throat> this is the area where the original road went down through this gully here. This is between Balcoda Drive and Chestnut Hill. And the old road, as I, I was there, I remember it, going walking down it. And you can see houses down in the, down in here, this area here, at Chestnut Hill. And the old road would go down through that gully and access around the pond and to the house, the square house and the longhouse. This is the bottom of the gully where it would have come out at one time. Now, obviously, Chapel Hill. This is the house that Michael and Louise Megan built in 88, 88 Chestnut Hill Drive. It was built in 1926. It is now owned by Dave Baldwin. And Michael originally owned three lots in this area here, and this is where he built his home. This is the book. Family of the Lion it was written by Gregory J. Meyer. It's a book about his family, a lot of genealogy. But there is the chapter in here about rifle range. And that's where I found a draft that's upstairs in the library. And that's what this is where it came from. But when I talked with the family, they had no idea how that draft got here in the library. <laughs> how you know where it, where it came from? Well, I did some more searching and found out that uh, the guy that purchased the house, uh, 88 Chestnut Hill Drive, Dave Baldwin, he had donated it to the library years ago, and he had received it from Greg when Greg's family, when Greg and his family <laughs> sold the house some twenty, some twenty, thirty years ago, and. He had received it from him at that point in time, and he had it all these years, and he was going to get rid of it, and decided to donate it, and that's how it ended up upstairs. This is this part here is the end of the chapter that uh, Greg wanted. There's there are many more stories still to be told, but the chapter goes on, goes on, and and now. I hope that a circulation of this work to family and friends will bring out more exciting aspects of the rifle range history that need to be told. And I sure there's probably still more stories. I mean, I found a few more and you know, I found old newspaper articles and whatever. And I mean, if anybody here or knows anybody, I'd love to hear the stories, you know, to get in contact with me and share the stories and I will document them and you know, send them off to the family and you know, share them with everybody. 
I blew that one soup. Uh, some of the stories that I found, uh, John Bartles, my good buddy, he lived at 86 Falcota Drive. This gully in the road went right down behind his house. And he, he told me stories about how his mom used to take him down there in the 50s and she'd go down there like in the afternoon and have a beer or something like that. And she, she, he remembers being placed up in a bar and you know he remembers the thing of watching the bubbles in her beer. Hmm. And that, that was his story. Buddy Rodenhaus told me a story where he used to go down there I'm in the late 40s with his buddies and they used to charge buy and charge candy to his dad's tab. And then at the end of the month, his dad would get the tab, get the bill, to chew him out for it. <laughs> and then uh, Jewel Rayburn, he remembers going down there with his dad and, and brother around 1961, and he remembers walking into the into the longhouse through the swinging saloon doors. And bottles were strewn all over, and junk was all about. But it looked like looked like an old western saloon. Like in the movies, he loved it. So, I would like to uh, thank Susan and Tim Meyer for their help, their book, and sharing Greg's draft and story about rifle range. I'd like to share uh, Jewel Rayburn for a picture and story. I'd like to Buddy Rodenhouse for his story, Dave Baldwin for giving the draft to the library here, um, Chris Kirchmeyer, John Gonzalez, and Mark Quinn. There's Seneca Park. They got me in my little tour through the park back in December. And my buddies, John Westerman, Dave Johnston, John Bartles, and the late Tom Schmidt for sharing the fun many, many years ago. That's the end.